Hello, and welcome to lesson four of learning Python. We're going to pick up today exactly where we left off from lesson three. We're even going to take the same program and continue working with it because there's more to it than we've actually finished in the last lesson. So let's first copy lesson three to lesson four. Now we're going to bring it up in the editor and we're going to go over a recap of some of the important stuff. Lesson three was a major amount of information. We introduced a lot of concepts, including functions or code reusability. See, in Python, as I said in lesson one, this is a skeletal language. The amount of commands that it really has is very small. But because you can add your own commands to the system, like what I did with the function get user input, you can actually expand it in ways that are unlimited. So functions are a critical component of Python and really all modern programming languages. But for Python, this is a really critical establishment. Now, you always have to indent the code of a function. Indents in Python are critical for code blocks, like the while command. That whole block needs to be indented. Let's highlight this. So everything in this block is attached to the while command. So while some condition do all of that, our condition is simply done. Done being false, while not done, while not done true. So that becomes the whole driving point of what we are doing. Specifically, we are asking the user a question and then waiting for the answer. But let's go actually see the main program. Here we can see closing price and we want to assign it the value of what the user gives us. Now in Python, and this really does apply to every language, but Python specifically, as we'll see in a future video, you need to think of your assignments. Variable equals something, as this line is. This is an assignment. You need to think of it as key equals value. So in this case, key equals value. You see, Python keeps a list of all the variables you use in your program in memory. And that list is how it knows what you want. The key is the variable. The value is what you want assigned to that variable. The key equals value context is riddled throughout all of Python's higher functionality. So it's better to start seeing this context now than to have to wait for it to take reality later. Because if you start looking at everything in Python in this context, 
for your assignments. Once we actually get to more complicated assignments through what's called a dictionary, this is going to be so second nature that you'll catch on to dictionaries very quickly. And a dictionary is one of the most powerfulest tools in Python. It's really part of what, make, what makes Python so powerful. It is an incredible tool, but it starts at the very basic understanding of key equals value. So we have the first input from the user, and we have extended language with our own function. We have given Python a new command, the command we wrote above. Now we do the same thing again. We get from the user risk and reward. And then we do some mathematics, and then we do some outputs. And now we get another input from the user, and we do more mathematics and more outputs. The big takeaway in this program is extending the language beyond its own functionality and being able to reuse a particular kind of system repeatedly without having to retype it. So we now have introduced modularity into our programs. And that is through a function. Now that function is really a very critical mainstay to everything you do and you will use this concept extensively. And that is where we are going to begin really today's lesson. We're going to take this particular situation and we're going to improve it. Specifically, we're going to focus on this section here. The try, accept, else, or just try, accept. Mm -hmm. This is Python's error management system. And it is really the worst way possible to handle this particular situation. The reason it's the worst way possible is because we know every single possibility that the user can give us simply because we can see the keyboard in front of us. This kind of a situation is really best used for situations we can't test and reproduce, like network communications between our program and the exchange. When we go to ask the exchange, for example, the most recent closing price of an asset. We are not guaranteed that we're going to get an answer, so we can't predict what's going to happen. This type of situation really is the basis point of the try and accept model working with unknown and unpredictable and unreproducible situations. When you know the situation, when you can predict the situation, and when you can reproduce the situation, you should actually program for the situation. The reason being is accuracy. You don't want to take an inaccurate situation into a real money trading environment when you know what the outcome could be. Remember, the end goal of this entire process is to have this machine using your real money. So you want to be as careful as you can in situations where you know 
what you are dealing with. You want to actually plan for on your own. So we are going to be replacing this section with a whole better approach. Part of that means understanding a little bit about what's going on under the hood. So we're going to bring up the Python editor, the interactive editor that is, and now we're going to assign a simple string. T equals Hello world. Nice, simple, and short. Now if you print T, you get hello world. That is the key, the letter T in this case, short for text, and the value hello world. What you are looking at is technically a packed list. A list in Python is a way of seeing data all correlated together as one entity. And you can actually take this list apart element by element. Now, in the last lesson, I introduced the while statement, while condition. In this lesson, I'm going to introduce the for statement. That is, we want to step through each piece of this list. So from the interactive editor for iterator, I, in, and we're going to introduce a new function, a function that's built in. We want to go within the length of T. That's one way of doing it, or we can do a technical shortcut and just go I and T. Now, always remember, like the while statement, you need a colon at the end of the line. Now, tab key, because we need to indent this block of code. We're simply going to print T and I. So T is our text, hello world. Brackets I means we want to take one section at a time or one element at a time. Now let's see if this works. And it doesn't. String indices must be integers. What does that mean? That means the index of our list must be a number. So let's go back and see what the computer actually gave us. Again, remember, what we think goes on oftentimes doesn't. And as you can see, it actually gave us the individual letter just from this simple construct for INT. So it broke down the packed list or the string into an unpacked list or the actual individual letters. Now this is important for the next step because remember what we did yesterday. We wanted to make sure the user only gave us numbers and a decimal point. Well, we're actually going to use this type of situation to break down what the user gave us. Character by character, like we see here with Hello World. And then we're going to compare here versus a list of numbers and a period. Now it will be a packed list like what we see on the screen, but it will give us a way to conveniently 
actually test in a con context and construct that we get only what we want. So let's go ahead and get out of this and let's go back into the editor. Now we want to replace all of this and we want to actually so we're going to leave this alone we're going to break this down simpler so if is number only of answer So if number only of answer is true, and in Python, you don't need to put the equals equals true, or you don't need to say is true explicitly, because the language automatically knows. Just like with the while statement, while not done, it automatically knows the context of true and false. So if is numbers only, is number only, we'll make this plural so it makes more sense. Then done equals true. Otherwise, enter a number. So no matter what the user puts in, if it doesn't meet the situation of a number, then we need to reject it and tell the user we want only a number. But that means we need to add another part to the language. We need to actually validate The user input. So we're going to define and we used is numbers only and we want to take the string that the user gave. Now this is a function, so it must end with a colon. Okay, so now indent. First thing we need to do is we need to give the computer what we actually want. So we're going to give it a string or a packed list So in our search, only these characters are acceptable. So now we're going to have to check every character that the user gave us with this list of numbers. Now I demonstrated one approach. Let's see if we can get a more clear approach. First, we need to go through or count the characters in the user string. So U S count in U string. But because we know that Python is automatically going to break down this list into the individual letters, 
let's call this U.S. Care, the actual character. So now that we have the actual character of the user string, we want to go one by one through our numbers list. So for that, for number in numbers. So basically at this point, we need to go through every single one of these characters and compare it to what the user gave us. Now there's two ways of writing this next section. One way is easy to understand. Another way might be a little confusing. The easiest way to understand is if user character in actually equals numbers of num. Actually, we don't need to do that. We just need to do num because it did it all for us. So if it's in there, then we're done. But that's not what we need to really do. We need to actually do this a little backwards. Because what we're doing is we're going to immediately exit with a false. So if the user character doesn't equal the number, then our condition is wrong. It's not a number in a string. So we break out of it altogether. We're done. But if it manages to go through every single number one by one, then we've succeeded and it is a number. Now this is a very forward way of looking at the problem. We have the user character, we have the number, we brute force compare the two and it just works. It gets the job done. So now we have is numbers only answer. If the user's input is only what we want, then yes, we are done. Otherwise, we are not done and the user is asked again to give us a number. So this is walking through every single character of the string the user gave us and every single character in this list one by one comparing the two. Question is will it work? The logic seems to be there, but is it the logic the computer sees? Let's find out. So one nineteen one two three, and it broke. Why? Because I typed something wrong. Let's go back and look at line 9. So U.S. string. Now let's see if it works again. It doesn't even though it's a number. 
y. Control C and let's go back and look at our logic. What did we do wrong? More specifically, what did we do wrong in the context of what the computer is seeing? Well, we're walking letter by letter through this list. What if the first digit we hit isn't a zero? In our case, we gave it 19,000. So the first digit of the user string is a one, but the first digit on this list is a zero. So what happens here? Well, this doesn't work. So even though logically it looks like it should, from the computer standpoint, it doesn't. And you're going to have a lot of these issues as you work through what you're trying to accomplish. Logic of a computer is different than the way our brains think. And so sometimes you need to go through and look at your problem specific to the logic of the computer. That is the case here. And we can actually simplify this a little bit by simply asking if USCHAR not in numbers. And that should be if, not is. And this actually changes the logic that the computer is seeing. And Python has a different context than most other programming languages, which makes this intuitive. So rather than trying to go letter by letter, Python does that for us by looking at it in numbers. So if what we give it is not in this list, no matter what the order is, then give it a false. So as you can see, logic is really your biggest challenge. Not necessarily your logic, but translating your problem into the computer's logic. So let's try this again and see what our results are. It worked. It worked because the logic of the computer fits into what it's supposed to. We're going to abort the program and let's try it again. It didn't work. I pressed enter and it gave me nothing because we didn't ask it to test for nothing. So we actually need to do that. The for loop will only count the number of characters that you give it. If you don't give it anything, then it simply falls through and gives you a true statement. So we need to actually test that the string is not empty. So if it's equal to an empty string, then we return false. So when you're looking at the for loop, it only works when there's something there. So when there's nothing there, it just falls through and doesn't do anything with the commands you gave it. Again, looking at the context of the logic as the computer sees it. So let's try again. Okay, now it knows because it explicitly looks for the possibility that the user gave it nothing. But what happens if I do this? 
Same thing. All right. What happens here? Same thing. We see this as perfectly legitimate. The computer doesn't. But it does see this as perfectly legitimate. But there's a fallacy here that we haven't dealt with. What happens if this happens? Somebody accidentally put in two periods. Well, it accepted it because it didn't explicitly look for the possibility of two different periods. So that's a problem we would need to try to find a way to solve if this was going into a production type system. So there's ways of dealing with problems, but logically, there's still more problems that need to be looked at. Sometimes the problems you deal with, particularly with user information and user interaction, are quite tedious. For example, in the 80s and early 90s, when secretaries were transitioning from typewriters to computers, one of the big problems was a lot of secretaries would type the letter L, a lowercase l, for the number 1, and a capital O for the number 0. A lot of older typewriters actually didn't distinguish between the letter L or a number 1. For example, here's a lowercase l, and here's the number one. At one time, they looked identical. And even for people whose vision isn't perfect, they still look identical. This whole process of actually trying to trap information and making sure it's valid is actually called data validation. And it's a very huge discipline in computer programming because it ties into the overall user interface. This is actually a specialty that deals with studying how users respond to the computer. So whenever you deal with user input, you must have some level of data validation. You must have some level of understanding and interacting with the user. A lot of what you will see in dealing with user information, particularly modern equipment, they try to eliminate all of these weird little problems by actually creating situations where the user can't enter the wrong information. For example, if you know you want a number only, ATMs are popular for this where they will only show a number pad, no letters. Other things are done, such as when you enter an address like 123 Jones Street. What you end up with is the programmer will decide to split the address into the number and the name where they can filter different types of information similar to what we've done here. Where they will ask for numbers only, then they will ask for a name, and then they will ask for lane, drive, street, circle, so forth. They'll actually split the address down to different layers to make it easier to validate what the user has given them. So as you develop your programming abilities, you'll begin to see how your logic to the problem you're trying to solve is in many times and in many cases going to be different than the logic, the computer, is going to solve. So it becomes a
place where put a print statement in there. Find out what the computer is doing. Find out how the computer is working. That is going to be how you solve your problems. Sometimes the problem will simply be not understanding what the computer is really seeing. For example, here, while not done, if is numbers only, well, we can actually go up, if is numbers only, we can actually print what the user gave us, and then we can actually take it apart and see letter by letter what the user gave us. So let's do that. Print US care. And now we're going to print numbers. Let's see how that looks. Let's give it 19,000. And it blew up. We have an error because we didn't type the case correctly on the symbol. The C should be capitalized. So even in debugging or tracking down problems, we can inadvertently add more problems. Okay, so you can see exactly what you are doing here. Now, let's give it something completely bogus. Okay, we gave it hello. It broke that down to the letter H, and it's not in what we want. So that code is working. It's doing what we expected. Hello, H is not in a number. It's not in that list. Now, conversely, if we gave it a list of letters or a string of letters, A through Z, then that would happen. And H is in that string. But specifically, let's go into the interactive compiler or interpreter and talk about this a little more detail. Let's give it a text string. Actually, let's say letters equals Okay, all lowercase letters. So now, G in letters is true because the letter G, the lowercase letter G, is in this list of letters. The computer is breaking them down one by one and checking them for us. But what if we give it a capital G? After all, a G is a G. No, it's not. The computer does know the difference in Python. Some languages don't, and upper and lower are the same. But for Python, there is a distinct difference. So when you use the in reference, you're asking Python to take your character and see if it is in that list. And of course, the list, let's do, for example, L equals. Now, Python has a special way of displaying unpacked or broken down lists. You don't need to necessarily memorize this right away or try to commit it to memory, but I'm going to show you exactly 
what the computer really sees. If you were to put hello individually, this is what the computer actually sees. A list of each letter by itself. Hello. That's it. That's the whole list. So L of the first position isn't a 1, but a 0. But the first position is, hello, is an H. Now using the above example, as I demonstrated earlier, it's the same. Even though we see two different things, it doesn't. So when you look for, say, the E in hello. So E in T is true. But E in L is also true. Luckily, we don't have to think about this for a simple string, but we would get into more complex things like tracking trades or keeping a list of orders. We do need to keep track of some of these details. Now, this is a very simple example but as we continue to develop within these lessons, you will begin to see that these simple examples are really the blueprint and basis for some very complex architecture. So it's important that you take your time, think about the logic of the computer, because you're not solving your problem the way you think you are. You're solving your problem the way the computer understands it. And that's not always intuitive. But this really gives you now the entire basic apparatus of really being able to build some very complex programs. We will begin to use these concepts aggressively and regularly as second nature, particularly the functions and extending Python into doing more complex things. For example, placing a trade, getting the balance from your exchange, running an algorithm that tells you whether or not you are within the acceptable range of a Bollinger Bands. These are all the building blocks that come from this simple example. And the next step to this is to take these examples and put them in another file or a library that you can then be referenced and use hundreds of times indefinitely for different situations altogether related to trading. For example, we could actually use is numbers only anytime we need to validate whether or not we have a pure number. We could use get user input over and over anytime we want to get a number from the user. So realistically, we can see now how we are progressing and moving step by step towards our end goal. The very first lessons of any programming language are always difficult to perceive or see those tiny steps with being able to really build, grow, and mature in the language to the point of building complex applications. But with the basis of lessons three, and lessons four, we now begin to see how the computer thinks and works versus how we think and work in relation to the problem we are actually trying to solve. 
So things are going to get a lot more complicated here in terms of how we apply what we've learned. But they're not going to be really that different. From this standpoint, really, you have the basics of Python. You can learn any point from here simply by reading because you have the basic stepping stones you need to break down the problem. The application now and moving forward is going to be looking at some more advanced properties, advanced situations like libraries, classes, looking at your problem as an object and then taking that object and manipulating it in a whole different way. These are all advanced concepts that are very easy once you understand the underlying stages. If you have any questions, be sure to leave them in the comments below. Take this to the next stage. Try different things. Is numbers only is interesting, but what happens if you want to deal with a market of aging consumers? Well, you have the blueprints now where you can actually take, build a list. Let's say Let's say we want to convert an L and an O to a 1 and a 0. You can easily modify this function with what we've already gotten to be able to actually search through the user string. If they give you a lowercase cell, then you can use that index to pull this character. Now you could take a S and a 5. You could take a Z and a 2. So depending upon your market and your abilities, of what your perceived user is going to be. Building your user interface can really be quite involved and a very critical part of the end stages of what you are building. For the purposes of our trading bot, it's going to run by itself. You don't need to worry about a lot of this. But these principles are very important between where we are at now and where we want to be when that bot is running by itself. Because in many ways, the information you get from the exchange is going to be just as random and unpredictable as if you gave it to a user to type in the numbers by hand. So you still need to think about data validation, even though there's no real user per se. This sounds complicated, but it's really not. Take your time, go step by step, play with the program, tweak it, see where it goes. The best way to learn is from the mistakes and the error messages the program gives you. Talk your way through the program. If you like this video, like it, share it. Remember that I put a lot of extra content on my Patreon and you'll find that link in the description. Leave any questions you have in the comments. Let me know. Be sure you ask if you have a question. You're not going to learn by not asking. Until next time.